Alberto. Welcome to the latest episode of uh, Flamingo's Apartment Rebels podcast. So on today's episode, I am excited uh, to welcome Ed Wolf, who is going to tell us exactly why apartment deposits are now extinct. So really, really excited to have Ed on. Uh, so Ed popped up on my LinkedIn um, for a bunch of times the last couple of uh, almost two years, and then finally reached out and connected with him. So really excited to uh, have Ed on the podcast. So Ed has been in the multifamily industry in various capacities uh, for quite a while. So I can say you are very much of a veteran. From Earthlink to web.com, um, not multifamily, but that's kind of where you got started and then to place uh, place properties to Pinnacle, Portland, and then moving on to the vendor side. So you have seen quite a few parts of the industry. So welcome, Ed. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here, Jude. Yeah, perfect. So you definitely have a very, very interesting bar- uh, background, but I would love to start with where you actually grew up. Sure. So I grew up in uh, Long Island, New York, Mm -hmm. Um, moved to Atlanta, Georgia in 1993 Mm -hmm. after college, Uh, spent really 17 years of my career in the Atlanta area, Mm -hmm. starting out in technology and then moving into multifamily in 2003 uh, and then moved to Dallas, Texas, which is where we live today. Oh, okay, so quite a few different places. I'm curious, how does Long Island compare to Atlanta and Dallas? Yeah, so um, Long Island, you know, is uh, a very sheltered mm-hmm. uh, experience, right? Because you're an hour and a half away from New York City, mm-hmm. um, and so moving to Atlanta was definitely an eye opener, right? Yep. Six million people. <laughs> Uh, but a great town, very welcoming, uh, great for business. Um, and, and then Dallas is equally uh, a, a pretty vibrant 9 million people in the Metroplex. Mm-hmm. Um, I always say Dallas is Atlanta with no trees. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but Atlanta and Dallas are both multifamily uh, mega yep. places. Yeah, right? the gray it's stars cool. and everyone else, and then the pinnacles. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're in multifamily, more than likely you're in one of these two cities. Mm-hmm. I call them sister cities. <laughs> nice. And then I'm curious, are you um, a Jets fan? Are you a Falcons fan? Or are you a Cowboys fan? Okay, that, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm going to answer it this way. Um, I am a Jets fan, and that's because mm-hmm. the Jets practice facility is on the Hofstra campus where I mm-hmm. got my undergrad. Um, but uh, I then became a Falcons fan living in Atlanta. But mm-hmm. now I'm a Cowboys fan. Now, if you ask yeah. me <laughs> who my baseball team is, mm-hmm. I will tell you I'm Go Braves. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, so you have one that you uh, super loyal to. Yes. But what happens if the Jets are playing the uh, Falcons or the Cowboys? Like, who do you root for at the end of it? It depends on where I'm located. Okay. <laughs> if, if I'm watching the game in Dallas, I have to be a Cowboys fan. I know that that probably is what we call a fair-weathered fan. Uh, but um, really – I, I mean, living in Dallas, you sort of have to be a Cowboys fan. Yeah. Um, also, you get run out of town, I assume. Exactly, you get run out of town. I, I don't necessarily want to get. I don't want to get run out of town just yet. <laughs> nice. Well, you are. That was very much of a very politically correct answer. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I see that you started in human resources with Earthlink and then Web.com. Can you talk a little bit more about those companies and what initially got you into human resources? Yeah. So I, when I got my undergraduate degree, Mm -hmm. um, a professor by the name of George Rukas 
was the Department of Labor secretary under Richard Nixon. And he was sort of a mentor uh, and an influencer and encouraged me to pursue human resources. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, I, I really didn't know what that was really all about, but yeah. he inspired me to pursue it. And so I got my bachelor's in business administration mm -hmm. with uh, a concentration in human resources. And so um, from there, um, I had the opportunity to get into the HR business yeah. um, with uh, charter communications oh, wow. uh, as a human resources manager. Um, and what I found was I really liked the people aspect of things. Mm -hmm. Um and it it enabled me to touch a lot of aspects of the business. Yeah. Um, and I'm sort of I have a servant heart, so I love paying it forward, and it just felt natural to me. I love that, and I think that's an interesting point about HR because it really does go across all different functions, and it looks like it really led into the next phase which is when you got into property management as the chief admin officer at Place Properties, where you were able to do a few things from IT to legal to compliance. And so with that move, were you also over HR or was it limited just to, oh, actually, no, you did oversee HR as well too. So for that one, like how did going across to property management um, impact how you viewed your career? So for you, was that something that you planned? Like, hey, I want to get into property management or was it more like I have an opportunity for a new role? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I fell into property management. Um, when, when I was recruited to place properties, mm -hmm. uh, they were looking for somebody to help bring the management, the third mm -hmm. party management in-house and to build that infrastructure and platform. Oh, wow. And I like building things. So this was an opportunity to really build a platform for mm -hmm. a up and coming, fast growing student housing, military housing, mm -hmm. a third party fee conventional business. Yeah. Um, and the, the gentleman that I attribute uh, really my success to was a, a gentleman by the name of Jim Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. who uh, was president and chief operating officer for Place Properties. And his background, uh, you know, he was president of Charles E. Smith. Mm -hmm. He was uh, in hospitality with Days Inn. Uh, he then was president and CEO of Burroughs and Chapin uh, out of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And he basically said, Ed, you know, you're more than an HR guy. Yeah. And I need you to help me build this platform. And so he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime and I'll be forever uh, grateful for that because Jim saw something in me yeah. um, and gave me the opportunity, which enabled me to get where I am today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you clearly knocked it out of the park. If your next roles were uh, leadership, like high level leadership roles at Pinnacle and then Cortland, who are both in the top 50 NMH and C uh, property management companies. So I'm pretty sure at Place Properties, it looks like you really, really did something uh, special. So how was transitioning from Place uh, from Place Properties to Pinnacle and then Cortland? Yeah, it's a good question, right? So Place Properties, student housing, military housing, third party, mm -hmm. conventional, right? Uh, we were, you know, student housing and talking in beds mm -hmm. is very different than conventional, affordable, military mm -hmm. housing at Pinnacle. And so Pinnacle, right at the time, was the third largest property management company in the country, headquartered out of Dallas, which is what enabled us to move from Atlanta to Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, third party fee management and managing to 350 unique owners mm -hmm. uh, was really a complete different experience and opportunity because there, I was asked to move the headquarters mm -hmm. for Pinnacle from Seattle, Washington to Dallas and to build that team. Oh, wow. And like I shared with you, I love building. Mm -hmm. So building that platform, building that team, putting process in place, mm -hmm. 
right, and positioning Pinnacle as a world-class multifamily owner operator mm-hmm. was just a once in a lifetime because we were yeah, managing five thousand units. Um, so, what was the reason for the move from Seattle to Atlanta? Yeah, so Stan Harrelson, which mm-hmm. was the CEO for thirty years, uh, oh, wow. basically, basically said, you know, um, Rick Graff, who uh, was then promoted to president. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to be centrally located. We need mm-hmm. a labor pool. We need yeah. uh, we need to look and you know what big multifamily owner operators are in Seattle versus Dallas or Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And so Stan had the foresight yeah. to his credit to say we're gonna we're gonna hire a chief administrative officer who's yeah. gonna create the blueprint to to take Pinnacle into the 21st century. Yeah. And um, that was in 2008, and it was a once in a lifetime opportunity that I'm again forever grateful. Yeah, no, that's smart and um, makes sense. Like I am based out of Chicago, and I always appreciate just how easy it is to get around. So I can get to the West Coast, I can get to the East Coast, I can get to the South all very quickly. So I imagine. <laughs> Uh, it's a little bit more difficult if you are a multinational property management company based out of like Seattle. No offense to the Seattle people. No, no, no. And oh, by the way, right, Jude? Mm-hmm. Here's what was the telltale sign. When I was living in Atlanta mm-hmm. and commuting to Seattle, it was a five hour plane ride. Yeah. Right? When we relocated to Dallas, it came, it went from a five hour plane ride to a yeah. three hour plane ride. <laughs> yeah, which makes all the difference in the world. Is the difference between sure. a day in, day out meeting versus, oh, I have to stay overnight. Exactly. Yeah. So you mentioned something pretty interesting that going from uh, place properties to Pinnacle uh, was quite a change because uh, Pinnacle is third party managed, meaning that you now have to work with hundreds of different owners. So what is that like? Is that, um, what are some of the key differences that came out of going from owner operated to now third party managed that you noticed? Yeah, Uh, at the end of the day, it's really what the owner Mm -hmm. is looking for, right? From a third party fee world-class operator, Mm -hmm. right? And what what they're buying for that management fee is, uh, world-class people, mm-hmm. uh, a scalable, reliable platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's all about driving asset performance. Yeah. Um, and if you don't have the people, you don't have the process, and you don't have the technology to mm-hmm. enable that, they will vote with their feet and find yeah. another owner-operator to manage that asset. Yeah. So it, it was a, a fantastic opportunity because – it enabled me to build mm-hmm. relationships with AEW mm-hmm. and um, uh, Invesco mm-hmm. and True America, right? Who were entrusting their portfolios to yeah. Pinnacle Manage. But make no mistake, at the end of the day, right? Uh, this is the people. It's this is a people business, mm-hmm. which translates back to HR. At the end of the day, right, it's attracting the right people, it's retaining mm-hmm. the right people, it's rewarding those people, and creating that connectivity yep. to drive asset performance. And at the end of the day, that's how you get measured. Mm-hmm. How are you improving the value of my asset? And yeah. if you're not improving it better than somebody else, I'm going to make a change. Yep. I love that phrase, which is like, they vote with your feet. So if you're not meeting their goals or their needs, then they are going to hop off. Yeah. So I think I want to kind of add some color to this, Jude. Mm -hmm. So the reason for me making the change to Cortland, um, right? Because to your point, Cortland, NMHC top 50, now 70,000 plus assets headquartered Mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Um, You know, the, the chairman of the board at Cortland had reached out to me and mm-hmm. said, hey, the next time you're in Atlanta visiting your folks, I want you to meet a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Well, his friend was Stephen DeFrancis. <laughs> and and Stephen shared with me uh, the need to hire a chief operating officer mm-hmm. uh, to, to take Cortland to its next phase of growth. Yeah. 
And so at the time that I joined Cortland, we had 11,000 units, 11,000. Wow. And we were bringing the management in house. Mm -hmm. We were putting in real page as our platform, mm -hmm. but there was nothing in place. There was no support infrastructure. There was no management infrastructure. Yeah. All that had to get built. So what a wonderful opportunity to go on the owner operator side. Yeah. Right. Take what I learned at place and pinnacle mm -hmm. but now control my own destiny. Yeah. And that's the, the operative term control destiny. Yeah. Um, and so that's the, the nuance of being a third party fee manager versus an owner operator at the end mm -hmm. of the day. Right. The constituent is the investor that's entrusted mm -hmm. you in managing the asset. And uh, what I loved about that was, again, building this infrastructure mm -hmm. and, and scaling the business for rapid growth. Yeah. So this might be a controversial question, but when you think about third party managed versus owner operated, yep. who do you think ultimately is more successful? Mm. You know, uh, I look at Graystar. Mm -hmm. Graystar is clearly successful yep. as the as the largest multifamily right mm -hmm. operator with 700, 730 thousand units under management. And oh, by the way, they just announced buying from Marty. Yep. That's the Denver thing is, yep. A two billion dollar acquisition of twenty plus properties. So clearly, yep. Graystar has been wildly successful. Mm -hmm. Um. I also see third. Uh, I also see owner operators mm -hmm. like Morgan or Harbor Group mm -hmm. that continue to acquire, control their own destiny. So really, right. um, I, I see it from both lenses. I think mm -hmm. you can be wildly successful uh, on both sides of the house as long yeah. as you have a strategy, mm -hmm. right? and a business plan with mutually agreed upon goals and objectives yeah. and the alignment and culture to bring about that success. Yeah. And I think it also depends too on what the metric that you define for success. Is it just like size? Is it resident experience as a whole? Is it uh, something else? But yeah, you can definitely see uh, both sides of it as well too. So in your time at Pinnacle and Cortland, what do you think were your biggest accomplishments? Or what are you uh, most proud of? Yeah, I will say one of the greatest accomplishments, and you know, Stan references this to this day, mm -hmm. was the orchestration of moving a 30-year-old corporate headquarters from mm -hmm. Seattle to Dallas with minimal disruption. Oh. Mm -hmm. to the business. Um, you know, we hired this entire team mm -hmm. in Dallas. We moved our corporate headquarters. Okay. We got new office space. Um, and we put Pinnacle on it, on the map in a, yeah. in a pretty significant way. Yeah. Um, that's one accomplishment I'm really proud of. Um, at Cortland, uh, building and putting in that infrastructure, uh, having real page as the core foundation, mm -hmm. hiring the key departmental leaders to oversee operations and support. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at it. I, I kind of use the analogy Jude is changing three tires in the middle of a road race. <laughs> that's really what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's sort of like, I mean, think of it this way in both cases, right. You've got a pretty formidable business that you need yeah. to keep operating. Yeah. And, at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. Mm -hmm. So it's not like business stops. So we have a huge, we, we, you know, there's huge wins that we put on the board, uh, save business, the businesses hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. by centralizing, by streamlining. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that manifested itself in the operating performance of those businesses. Mm -hmm. So typically what goes into that? Like what are the biggest risks? I know you've touched on that a little bit, but what, what are the typical biggest risks? Because I can see that there are just a lot of different implications. 
So for yeah. you all, for companies kind of going through the same thing, like what were some of the biggest risks that you guys saw or experienced? Yeah, so I'm gonna give you a real example. Mm -hmm. uh, I oversaw property accounting mm -hmm. at Pinnacle. Think of it this way, Pinnacle was producing 800 property statements a month. Oh, wow. There are 350 owners with 125 associates. Mm -hmm. My task was to centralize operations in Maitland, Florida. Right? There was an accounting center mm -hmm. in Seattle. There was an accounting center in Orlando. And think of the huge change management and orchestration. Yeah. Right? The business can't miss a beat. Mm -hmm. Property statements have to continue to be performed. And I attribute that success story to one individual who I absolutely adore in the industry, <laughs> Sally Milton. Nice. Well, Sally, Sally. Sally Milton, <laughs> Orlando, Florida, 30 years with Pinnacle. She's an absolute doll. Nice. She nice. ran property accounting, got promoted mm -hmm. several times, um, but she had what it what it took mm -hmm. to make the migration, embrace the people, mm -hmm. ensure that that we that we didn't miss a statement, um, that it was on time. Mm -hmm. and it was accurate. But again, think of it this way, closing down one accounting center, moving it across the country yeah. while keeping the lights on is no small undertaking. Yeah. And that, that's all Sally. Wow. She made it happen uh, in, a, in a very significant and meaningful way. Nice. Well, um, Sally, if you're listening to this, awesome work. <laughs> Yeah, she's she is really um, she's a unique and very special individual that uh, I stay in touch with and think the world of. Yeah, that's awesome, Ken. And then, um, so your next phase was moving from the property side to the vendor supplier side uh, with leasing desk. So, what made you want to move on to the supplier side of the industry? Yeah, it's a so um, one thing that uh, I hope comes out on this podcast, mm -hmm. and, and it's really core and fundamental to what I attribute mm -hmm. my success to. It's all about relationships, mm -hmm. and and so uh, the individual that I will be forever grateful for giving me the opportunity to join RealPage is Janine Steiner. Janine was my executive sponsor at Pinnacle mm -hmm. and at Cortland. And uh, was she also at both, pro at both companies? Um, well, Janine was executive vice president at RealPage. Mm -hmm. Oh, gotcha. And she was the right hand to Steve Wynn. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a RealPage customer three times. Mm -hmm. Place properties. Pinnacle in Cortland. Yeah. And when Janine reached out to me and then Steve Wynn, who I will be again, forever grateful for mm -hmm. giving me the opportunity. When Steve invited us to dinner uh, at his home in Dallas mm -hmm. and, and basically was so welcoming and so um, accommodating, mm -hmm. it was like I was going to work with family because I knew all of these real page executives and I mm -hmm. saw uh, what Steve Wynn's track record was. I saw what Janine was able to do yeah. initially running yield star uh, revenue management and then taking over renter's insurance and then taking mm -hmm. over resident screening and then taking over business uh, intelligence. I thought this is a once in a lifetime to stay close to the industry that I love mm -hmm. But at the same time, get back into technology, yeah. which is where I cut my teeth um, in my career. And then it also was a good compliment when I got my MBA in technology from Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. So that's why I made the leap to the vendor side. That's awesome. So what were, for you, some of the big differences uh, that you saw on the vendor side after spending so much time? on the property management side. Yeah, I would say to you, the biggest difference 
is, and it was an adjustment mm -hmm. that now, right. I'm having to sell mm -hmm. <laughs> and communicate to my peers. Yep. And I wasn't always going to get a response. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I would have given a response to when I was on the other side of the nest. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one uh, nuance. That was an adjustment. Um, the other adjustment was, and it was sort of a mind shift, mm -hmm. going to the vendor side enabled me to touch and impact more people mm -hmm. than I could being behind the desk and being like responsible for one company. organization. Got it. Um, and so it was, uh, and so now I see myself, you know, being on the vendor side really since 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and I really enjoy it uh, because I don't look at it as work, Jude. I, I'm having a consultative conversation. Mm -hmm. And what I like about it is my peers are asking me for advice and counsel, yeah. not so much on what lease lock does, mm -hmm. but what the where where I see the industry going, yeah. where do I see technology going, and I enjoy the consultative and prescriptive approach that my role at lease lock affords me mm -hmm. to do. I love that, and I think that's exactly right. On the supplier side, you are really able to have a much much bigger impact than at the singular company that you add. So love that. So coming up on uh, your current role at LeaseLock, I uh, would love to dig into that. So you are CRO, which is the Chief Revenue Officer. So what does that actually mean? What is a Chief Revenue Officer? Yeah. So I'm responsible for the customer experience, mm -hmm. uh, voice of customer. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm responsible for driving top line revenue growth through mm -hmm. my enterprise sales customer success teams. Mm -hmm. um, and I have the opportunity, quite frankly, to accelerate lease locks growth mm -hmm. right, as we continue to change the way people view security deposits mm -hmm. and the mission of our company really resonated with me in terms of us helping the world find home. Mm -hmm. And that, that could, that created a connectedness for me that I saw as a, again, once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. Awesome. So what exactly is lease lock for those that do not know? Lease lock is the only lease insurance product on the market that eliminates security deposits mm -hmm. altogether. Mm -hmm. This is not to be confused you with all the other competitors in the market that mm -hmm. are security deposit alternatives that are options for the resident. Mm -hmm. Lease lock gets you out of the security deposit business, yeah. right? Others keep you in it, mm -hmm. right? So when you think about security deposits, they haven't changed since the 15th century, mm -hmm. right? They've been literally, They've been around that mm -hmm. long, but we know there are security deposit failures mm -hmm. that are known. They create a poor resident experience, right? They yeah. don't cover all the losses mm -hmm. and it creates friction for the consumer on the front end mm -hmm. and on the back end from an accounting mm -hmm. perspective. Remember earlier, I shared with you my property accounting teams, mm -hmm. right? 125 folks in Maitland, Florida, which is right outside Orlando. They were like, Ed, when can we get out of the security deposit administration business? Mm -hmm. It's cumbersome. It's clunky. Keeping separate escrow, bank yeah. accounts, refunds, reconciliations are an absolute headache. Mm -hmm. So I kind of see it two, two ways, which I think is what uh, you kind of reference. On one side, security deposits are bad for the resident and then also bad for the property. We'll have to dig into two uh, into both sides of it. Sure. So I imagine for the resident side, the reason why the upfront security deposits are bad is because one, it's a lot of upfront cash. Like when someone is about to move, 
they are having to spend on movers. They are having to spend on uh, adding new furniture, all these like upfront expenses that comes as part of a move. And then on top of that, their new properties asking them to say, hey, uh, give us this huge upfront cash, which for most people is probably not that realistic. So is that why security deposits are bad for the resident side or are there other reasons why they are bad for the resident experience? Yeah, no, so you're onto something. And so let me provide a little bit more color to that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. that, that's a true statement. That is fact-based, mm -hmm. right? If you wanna do a fact checker. Yeah. Um, so when, when at the end of the day, the property management company is asking for one month security deposit, mm -hmm. that's a problem, yeah. right? So how is that helping the world find home? It's not. Mm -hmm. So we've become a subscription based economy, mm -hmm. right? My iPhone 12, I'm paying T-Mobile $29 and seven cents a month. Mm -hmm. Can I buy the phone? Sure. Do I want to pay $1,100? Dollars up front. That's a lot. <laughs> no. So, right, lease lock enables the resident to move in by paying a monthly fee in conjunction with their rent. Mm -hmm. And so they're now <clears throat> able to move in to a community that is a zero deposit community. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So, right, it's enabling people to save their money, right? And pay as you go. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Number two, who wants to tie up that much money yep. up front, right? Not many. So, and oh, by the way, here's the next thing. Most people hope that they will get that security deposit back. Yep. After the <laughs> yep. But the fact of the matter is the deposit is never enough to cover the damages mm -hmm. on move out, let alone if you have to evict, right? Mm -hmm. The average cost of an eviction is $7,600. Oh, wow. So those are, that's real money. Well, guess what? The owner is not protected with a security deposit, mm -hmm. but with lease lock you are, right? Because it's lease insurance and it protects the owner for skips, evictions, attorney's fees, and damages, including mm -hmm. pet damage, for a monthly amount that the resident pays for. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the words of our clients, Ed, this is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And I would agree, which is why I saw the future in lease lock and why I joined two and a half years ago. Yeah. No, absolutely love that. And just kind of reminded me of one experience I had a couple of years ago where when I moved out of my apartment, I actually forgot to ask for my security deposit. It was like a smaller walk up. And I think, I don't know if the owner just like forgot to give me the security deposit or they did it on purpose, but it was just one of those things where I was like, huh, I'm sure this happens a lot where you put in a security deposit and you somehow forget to get it back. And whoever owns the property, if they are less than ethical, they might not right. give it back to you. Right. So I'm curious then. So the second part of that you mentioned is that it creates an accounting nightmare for the properties. Did I uh, hear that correctly? And what does that look like having to hold on to security deposits? Yeah. So, so here's the thing. You have to keep, right? the security deposit monies in a separate mm -hmm. account, mm -hmm. right? And it has to be interest bearing and there are nuances by state. Mm -hmm. So from an accounting perspective, right? There's gotta be a reconciliation yeah. of those accounts. There's gotta be an audit of those accounts. There has to be a reporting of those accounts. And then, oh, by the way, when it comes time to process the refund, mm -hmm. they have to cut a check right? And that check may or may not make it to mm -hmm. the resident because we don't have the last known address. Yeah. Okay. And then the check sits in limbo. And then there's a period of time where the check has to get cashed. I mean, again, you look at all of those headaches, mm -hmm. they're real and it's problematic. Yeah. Right. 
And so, again, right, we talk about the resonant experience. The resonant experience is less than positive in that mm-hmm. regard, right? Yeah. Because now it's something they have to think about. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, it's never going to be what they think it should be. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we're trying to avoid, right? We're trying to avoid the friction on the front end yeah. and on the back end. And, oh, by the way, guess where that manifests itself? Where that manifests itself is in reputation management Mm -hmm. and negative reviews. Yeah. So guess what? I was actually thinking exactly the same thing too, because if that happens, it's so easy to say, hey, this property stole my money. (laughs) That's right. So one of our customers, right, Jennifer Mm Statochis, who is executive vice president of of property management at Western Wealth Communities, Mm -hmm. she actually also serves on our advisory board. And mm-hmm. Jennifer has been more progressive than most because she's on the NOC advisory board. She's on the Zillow advisory board mm-hmm. and she's a marketing social extraordinaire. Yeah. She cut to the chase and said, Ed, this product is a no brainer because it eliminates the reputation management negativity element that goes with security deposits on the back end. So that's what why- those exactly is it? Is it what I kind of mentioned, which is residents get pissed off if for whatever reason they don't get their security deposit back? Or what is the impact of security deposits to the reputation? Yeah. So the resident never thinks it's been handled the way it should. Mm -hmm. And when they don't get their security deposit back or they get dinged for damages, they're going right to the social channels and letting people know. And guess what? Once it's out there, it's not retractable. Mm-hmm. And so when you're looking at the resident experience and reputation management, that's huge in this business. Yeah, now, oh, it's, now. it's huge. It's huge. No, so absolutely uh, love what you guys are doing. So looking at um, how you guys frame the problem and how you all solve it, you already touched on how you all do it differently. So looking at the benefits from the property manager side, one of one of which is it cuts down on the admin and operational headache that they have to deal with because now they one no longer have to have like separate accounts uh, to manage like the security deposits. So how are you all able to do that from a logistical perspective? Do residents pay the property directly? Do they pay you? I think you mentioned that residents pay the property as part of their rent. So then how do you all make money? Do you um, send an invoice back to the property each month or when uh, do you guys get involved in that? Yeah, so I'm going to simplify this. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's very simple. Mm-hmm. Lease lock invoices the property mm-hmm. for the premium and the property mm-hmm. then charges the resident mm-hmm. that monthly amount so there's huge ancillary income opportunity oh, right, really? for the owner operator to benefit from. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, at the same time, right, that resident is paying it every month mm-hmm. with their rent. It's a line item on their resident ledger that says deposit waiver fee. Mm-hmm. It's in the lease addendum. So it's clearly disclosed. Yeah. But it's not an out of workflow, Jude. Right. We're vertically integrated with all five of the major property management systems. And mm-hmm. so whether you're Yardi, Entrada, MRI, Resmin, um, or RealPage, mm-hmm. right, we push the charge mm-hmm. to the resident ledger and the site has to do nothing. Mm-hmm. Which is yeah. every property manager's dream is they get benefits without having to do anything. Bingo. So then you mentioned something interesting earlier, which you, which was that um, you guys are very different from the usual like security deposits alternatives. Um, so you guys are more of an insurance company. So in what ways have the uh, deposit alternatives not met the needs of property managers? Yeah, good question. So right when you if you start out fundamentally mm-hmm. with a security deposit alternative, the first Security deposit alternative that was brought to market was Sure Deposit. Mm-hmm. I was a Sure Deposit customer back in 2003. Mm-hmm. Surety bond math 
doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The amount of money that you're collecting, right, from the resident mm -hmm. outside of the workflow, right? Remember, lease lock, lease insurance is business to business. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is business to consumer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at the end of the day, the consumer is interacting directly with the provider. In this mm -hmm. case, let's use the sure deposit example. Yeah. So if the resident is paying $87.50 for a surety bond that protects the resident for $500, mm -hmm. right? $87.50 gets split. There's a portion that goes to the company, mm -hmm. and then there's a portion that goes into the pool. Well, think about it. If a portion of that goes into the pool, and now there's a claim that has to get filed, mm -hmm. right? And you've only funded the pool with fifty dollars of the eighty-seven fifty, yeah. And the claim is for four fifty. Where's the difference coming from? Mm. That's where the pools go upside down. Got it. And the math doesn't work. Got it. In in our case, it's it's true insurance with reinsurance. Mm -hmm. In our case, we're backed by QBE. $43 billion in assets, mm -hmm. right? So this, this business isn't going anywhere anytime soon. But again, because the space has gotten noisy and crowded, mm -hmm. people confuse security deposit alternatives as insurance. Yeah. And they're not. Got it. So given that fact that you guys are more of like the insurance model, are you all considering like rent as insurance? Because I imagine that is also a huge headache for properties. You know, uh, as we continue to look on the horizon for lease lock, there's, there's lots of uh, natural add-on mm -hmm. to our risk management suite. Mm -hmm. So renter's insurance is not out of the question by any means. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, our focus is on the core. Mm -hmm. So if I look at, you know, the hedgehog concept, right? Let's be the best in the world at one thing. Mm -hmm. Let's perfect it. And because we were the first and only to build a proprietary lease insurance mm -hmm. product, we continue to refine, perfect, enhance that product, mm -hmm. right? Right. We are a data first, innovative company that is changing the way the world sees deposits. So when mm -hmm. we talk about deposits are extinct, yes, that's a bold statement. Mm -hmm. But we believe the days of the security deposit will soon be gone. Mm -hmm. And that's been evidenced. Right. When you look at the deposit law legislation that is sweeping mm -hmm. the nation. Yeah. Right. Cities like Cincinnati, cities like Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, Chicago, uh, Pennsylvania, right? These, right, renting, renter affordability, mm -hmm. renter's choice is real. Yeah. And that's where I, we stand behind that deposits will be eliminated for good and become extinct. Yeah, I love that. So um, going on to the pandemic, like in what ways has that proven out that statement that security deposits are extinct? Yeah, I think the pandemic has accelerated and, and been a catalyst for our business. We grew 400 percent last year. Wow. We're on the we're on that same trajectory in 2021. Mm -hmm. Right. People are seeing the future as we do. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, if they want to get out of the security deposit business altogether, mm -hmm. remember what I said earlier, we are a replacement. We eliminate deposits. Mm -hmm. We're not an alternative to deposits. Yeah. We're not an option to deposits. We're a replacement for deposits. And that's a difference. Yeah. So, yeah, so we see, right, housing affordability and that crisis real. Mm -hmm. We see uh, wage growth, not where it needs to be, mm -hmm. right? And that has accelerated our business. Look, we have a government affairs team, and we are working closely and collaboratively with our friends uh, at the National Multi-Housing Council and Doug mm -hmm. Bibby, who's been a great partner. 
uh, as well as the National Apartment Association with Bob Pinnaker. Yeah. I mean, these two institution institutions and individuals have been great advocates and partners for us uh, as the landscape continues to change, mm -hmm. right? And um, these eviction moratoriums and everything that has resulted with those yeah. have exacerbated and accelerated our business. Yeah. And, no, so happy to hear that because I, I cannot imagine going from the fact that most people are living like paycheck to paycheck and then you add everything else that came from the pandemic how much of an impact it would be if I am about to move and someone asks me like, hey, pay a one month upfront uh, as a deposit and then pay my first months as well too. Well, so I, I can't really see where that need comes from. Yeah, I will say to you, right, you're in Chicago, but I was in New York a few weeks ago mm -hmm. with an event we were hosting for clients. Um, and uh, I was with a, 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 a prospect from mm -hmm. Blackstone and he was telling me that he just, uh, moved into an apartment in Tribeca. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, uh, his rent is 6,000 a month. Jesus. And his first month security deposit was $6,000. And I almost fell out Holy of my Holy crap. And so I said to him, Dan, are you serious? And he Jeez. said, yeah, that's what it is. That's a cost of doing business and wanting to live in New York. Wow. Right. So that I realized that's an extreme, right? No, but, but fact, that's what the problem is. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is another friend of mine in Dallas, right, mm -hmm. that's moving. The, 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 it's a one-bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. It's $1,650 a month, yeah. right, which is a mortgage payment. Yeah. And his security deposit's $500. Mm -hmm. $500 is a significant upfront. Mm -hmm. If you told me that I could pay twenty a month, yeah. Or 240 for the year and pay as I go yeah. versus coming out of pocket $500 if I'm going to move in by November 1st, I'm yeah. going to choose the $20. Yeah, it's like what you said earlier, which is that the world has become a subscription economy. And there is a reason behind that because for the majority of people, no one wants to pay so much upfront if you are able to split that up into uh, monthly payments. So, no, completely makes sense. Totally. Yeah. And then so besides like security deposits, um, you have a lot of industry knowledge and a lot of experience both on the vendor side and then on the property manager side. What are some things that you think the industry gets wrong about resident experience and what residents actually want? You know, it's I think it, it, it's a good question. And I think it starts here. Right. It starts at understanding by soliciting feedback from the mm -hmm. resident about what's most important, right? Mm -hmm. We partnered with Kingsley uh, Surveys, which is yeah. now part of Grace Hill. They're a strategic partner, mm -hmm. the lease lock. And we just rolled out this uh, resident survey um, to, uh, in conjunction with Grace Hill, mm -hmm. the masses. And uh, this is where we really need to be better in tune with what the resident really wants, right? Mm -hmm. Do they want wine and cheese parties or do they want, you know, high speed internet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so my point in all of that is resident surveys are a great way mm -hmm. to understand truly what the resident wants and needs. Yeah. Now, if you're looking at a ground up development, right, that's equally as important to figure that out before the construction begins. Yeah. It's like right? don't build a golf simulator if people do not want golf simulators. Exactly. Listen, I remember 20 years ago, right? What was in vogue were tanning beds. Mm -hmm. Now people want hot spots, mm -hmm. touchdown stations. Yeah. So the industry evolves, right? So better to understand what the wants and needs are, mm -hmm. right? And I, I will tell you, here's one, right, that, that continues to gain tremendous popularity. It's not a new concept, but it's mm -hmm. becoming more in vogue, is concierge, mm -hmm. especially with the pandemic. I want my groceries delivered. I yeah. want my dry cleaning delivered. I, I need you to, you know, I, 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 need, uh, I need a professional shopper. Yep. Um, I want a house cleaner. I want all of these things. Exactly. Right. Um, I, and that's a huge thing that we are seeing as well. It's really a change from 
physical amenities. So like your pool, your yoga room, your resident lounge to more service amenities, which are the things that actually really make life super convenient for uh, residents. Totally. So and then what are, um, as we kind of wrap up, um, you have a lot of perspective from all sides of things. So what are your top one, two, or three predictions that you have for the apartment industry over the next few years? Uh, so prediction number one mm -hmm. is, and, and this is not something that's an aha moment, mm -hmm. but uh, the stigma of apartment living is gone. Mm -hmm. It's now a choice. It's a lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? People want to lock and go. We see that in the pandemic, right? We, you know, people are moving to destinations mm -hmm. that they want to go to. Yep. And the apartment business enables that flexibility. Mm -hmm. So the continued expansion uh, I see will continue on to the horizon. Mm -hmm. And the demand continues to outpace supply. Mm -hmm. That's prediction number one. Prediction number two, um, residents will have, will continue to have greater expectations mm -hmm. yep. of, their, the, of their, their management company mm -hmm. and property overall. Mm -hmm. And if the resident doesn't believe the experience they're getting is what it should be, they will vote with their feet yep. and they will find that experience elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, I don't see uh, housing affordability changing anytime mm -hmm. soon. And so therefore, solutions and products that enable the resident to the resident and the owner mm -hmm. right, to accelerate moving, to reduce bad debt, to maximize asset performance mm -hmm. and to accelerate leasing velocity will continue to be in vogue. Yeah. And so that's security deposit replacements. Mm -hmm. That's flexible rent solutions. That's virtual leasing. Um, that's amenity, you know, concierge services mm -hmm. like, any program or solution that drives asset performance, reduces bad debt, mm -hmm. and accelerates leasing yes, to totally. improve NOI will continue to skyrocket. I love that. So I really, really enjoyed this conversation and really learning more about your history, uh, both on the property management side and then the vendor side. And you've obviously done really well in all those different roles um, shown by what you did uh, for Pinnacle, what you've done for what you did for Cortland, and now what you are doing for Lease Log. So for those that are just getting started in the industry, whether it's on the supplier side or the property management side, what is your advice to them? Or what are some of your um, pieces of advice for how to really get to where you where you are? Uh, never. I know you mentioned relationships earlier, but yeah, it's all about relationships, mm -hmm. right? At the end of the day, uh, it's aligning yourself with those individuals and 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 building that relationship currency. Mm -hmm. um, that's point number one. Number two, uh, never be satisfied with the status quo and accepting mm -hmm. mediocrity, yeah. right? you've got to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. If you are interested or intrigued in property management, mm -hmm. then you need to put yourself out there and align yourself. LinkedIn is a wonderful tool. I use it every day. Yep. Um, LinkedIn has paid dividends for me personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. My point there is, right? I found you. <laughs> yeah, and so, right, using those social channels, mm -hmm. right? And then third, um, is, is pushing yourself and growing yourself professionally. I'm a voracious reader, 
right? And I'm constantly looking mm -hmm. for books that are going to push me, that are going to yeah. uh, expose me to new ideas, fresh perspectives. The latest book that I have is Bet on Yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a New York Times bestseller. It talks about exploring breakthrough opportunities. Anne, who's the author, um, you know, worked alongside mm -hmm. uh, the founders at Google, worked alongside Jeff Bezos, okay. right? Um, it's having the emotional fortitude and the emotional courage mm -hmm. to put yourself out there and, and constantly grow yourself. Yeah. It's all about like learning. So Ed, thank you so much for being on our episode. So absolutely, absolutely enjoyed this conversation on why uh, deposits are extinct and learning a little bit more about you and then about like lease lock in general. And then I think your predictions for the future of multifamily is spot on. The residents are going to vote with your feet. And I think right now, a lot of properties are seeing that where expectations keep going up but interestingly what i've seen is that a lot of properties are like what do we need to do to tamper resident ex uh, resident expectations rather than what can we do <laughs> to meet those expectations a lot more so i think you hit it right on the head is that for the people that are doing it residents are going to vote with your feet and head straight over there so thank you so much for being on our uh, on the Apartment Rebels podcast. Thank you, Jude, for the opportunity. It's been a true pleasure.